Good morning. 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 <laughs> well, we are few in number, but uh, mighty in spirit. We're glad you are all here this morning for our worship service at Grace United Methodist Church. This is a communion Sunday, obviously, and for the first time in a long time, we'll be using uh, the chalice instead of little uh, cups of uh, juice. Uh, so we'll be giving you a piece of bread, then you dip it, dip it into the cup, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, please fill out the attendance form that's on the bulletin. And we are very glad to have with us Kent Brooks once again. Always great to have Kent. And I'll be preaching from the floor again. So if you, any of you want to move back, feel free to do so. And, uh, oh, the Easter lily orders. There's a form attached to the bulletin, and they are due next Sunday. So please remember that. And a week from tomorrow, we'll all have a chance to meet our new bishop, Dan Schwerin. Clergy will meet in the morning with him, and then laity will meet in the evening at uh, Glenview United Methodist Church at 7 p.m. And I hear just great things about the bishop and we're very excited to have him here, and it'll be great to meet him and get to hear what he has in store for our conference. There's no registration needed, just uh, show up. And if you need directions or anything to Glenview UMC, just let us know. Um, where's my thing? Oh, I left it back there. Okay. No, no, no. Um, we'll be doing a Lent book study uh, this Lent coming up soon. And it is uh, a new book by Adam Hamilton. Who else? I, I do not get royalties <laughs> from using Adam Hamilton, I assure you. Uh, but it's a really good one. It's on Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And it takes us right on through to Holy Week and so forth. And he used it himself in his church, Church of the Resurrection in, in Kansas City, uh, for a Lenten study. So, I mean, it, it relates directly to what we'll be dealing with. And so in the Gospel of Luke, I think it's Jesus and the outsiders, outcasts, and outlaws. <laughs> so, so it should be very good. He's always very good, and I think it'll be a very uh, a nice thing. It will start the day after Ash Wednesday. So I believe that's the 23rd at 2 o'clock in the library, and we're looking forward to that. All right, let's see. Oh, big news. Great big news. We are very glad that uh, beginning actually on Ash Wednesday, but officially on uh, March 5th, the first Sunday in March, we will have a permanent substitute, a permanent guest organist. And we are very glad that it is Tim Plambeck. Anybody know that name? He teaches uh, music at Lake Forest Academy. He's done that for more than 20 years, and he's also taught at Juilliard and Manhattan School of Music and Cleveland Institute, so he sounds good. He has had operatic experience with Lyric Opera. He's a graduate of St. Olaf College, has a master's degree in piano performance from the University of Michigan. So we are very excited that Tim has agreed to uh, be with us here until we find our own a full-time organist. And I think we may be able to persuade him <laughs> to stay. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? And the person who found out about him, or the person who knows him, is Harry Nichol. He was the music director at Deerfield UMC when Harry and Lois attended there. And Harry was helping us call around to different folks. And uh, it was just wonderful that he was open and available. So we are really looking forward to this, and this is a real answer to prayer. So thank you, Lord. All right, let us prepare our hearts for worship. This morning's centering words. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. 
heal, enliven, and let your light shine. Our opening prayer, let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your Son who came to fulfill your law. Guide us in imitating Jesus, being salt and light to those around us. May your goodness shine through us as we live under your realm and teach others your ways. Amen. This morning's Gospel reading will be from one of the Synoptic Gospels. As you'll remember, Mark came first about two decades after the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, collecting the stories of Jesus for those churches that Paul sent his letters to. A decade later, both Luke and Matthew retold those stories to very specific external audiences, Luke to the Gentiles, and Matthew, very importantly, to those of the book, people who read and understood and lived by the law of the Hebrew Bible. And it is in Matthew's synoptic gospel that he seeks to convince the people of the book that Jesus has come to fulfill the promise of the covenant from God to the Hebrew people. We will read a passage from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have, not, I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I turn my page. Gather us in. We'll be singing verses 1, 3, and 4, page 2236 in your black hymnal.
come together and share our joys and concerns as a church family and then pray together. Uh, Maureen's surgery was very, Andy, you're not here, are you? Maureen's surgery was very successful and she is recovering well. So let's continue to pray for her. Um, Chris uh, Phillip, as we mentioned last week, his uh, cancer has spread and he is weak and just um, not feeling very well and kind of down. So let's be praying for him and be great if you could send him a card or give him a call. And Jim Runkle is doing very well with his immunotherapy, so we're very glad about that. What joys and concerns would you like to share? Oh, yeah. And I can just project. The, the Zoom okay. people won't okay. hear it. Oh. <laughs> or the Zoom people. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, it's so good to be with all of you again. I, I feel like family. I've been here so many times, so I thank you for that. In that spirit of family and community, uh, I mentioned one time before that my brother uh, was about to have a pacemaker. It yes. had to be put off because he caught pneumonia. Well, his pacemaker uh, is scheduled for this coming Tuesday. So prayer for my brother Henderson, Henderson. Um, for his procedure on Tuesday. At the same time, I'm about to be a great uncle again, so my niece is expecting any time now. And in fact, tonight they're going to induce labor. So Prayer for my niece, Selena. Absolutely. Wonderful. Yes, congratulations. Yes. Great news. Fantastic. And I'm very glad Henderson is finally able to uh, get his pacemaker. Thank you. Others? Anyone? Malcolm? Uh, my joy is to see Gil here today. Uh, we haven't seen him in church too much lately, but can you hear me? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's my joy to see uh, Gil with us today. Yes. And Gil Clark is with us. Gil, great having you here. Others? All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, with great kindness and gentleness, you shape our lives and lead us. Hear us now as we gather to offer our prayers and petitions. We pray for our world, for governments and their leaders. May all who rule honor justice and compassion so that the people may flourish. We pray for peace around the globe, especially where there is great unrest and tension. God of all wisdom, you give your church understanding for recognizing how your spirit moves in our lives. Guide us in following and teaching the law of Christ, the law of the heart, for the greater good of your realm on earth. Shine your light on our hearts so that our church's ministries serve as channels of your powerful grace to people in need of your grace. God of compassion, you hear the cry of all who are in distress. Bring back to welcoming arms all those who have strayed. Bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. Heal those who are suffering. Comfort them in their need and renew those who care for them. Lord, we bring you our own joys and concerns. We are very joyful to have Gil with us back today. And we continue to pray for him in his time of grief. And Lord, uh, we just are glad that he is here among his church family today. We pray for um, uh, uh, Keith's great niece, uh, who is delivering uh, very soon. Lord, we pray that that go well and that uh, everything uh, turn out fine and that uh, uh, Kent be able to uh, see her uh, very soon. And Lord, we pray that the procedure to have Henderson's pacemaker implanted go well. Lord, we are glad that he's finally able to uh, get this after getting over pneumonia. And we are very thankful uh, that he uh, will be able to live a much better life because of it. God of light, may we be a city on a hill not hidden, but openly beckoning and welcoming those made in your image, 
wishing to join us in our journey of faith as followers of Jesus, who gave us these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now receive your tithes and offerings.
loving God, we give you thanks for all you have bestowed on us, and we praise you for your boundless goodness. Bless these gifts for the work of your kingdom, and help us in, use, in using them wisely and, and everything that you have provided. Through Christ our Lord, amen. You may be seated, and our next hymn, you may remain seated for that, is One Bread, One Body. Page 620 in the Red Hymnal, we'll be singing verses 1 and 2. That was just, it boggles the mind, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I forgot to mention our Zoom folks. Hello, Zoom folks. There are a number of you here attending with us, and we're very glad. Let's pray. Holy God, your blessings are abundant, and your wisdom exceeds our grasp. 
Fill us with your spirit as we hear your word this day, that we may be justice seekers and peacemakers, sharing life in Christ, especially among those who are forgotten, weak, or persecuted. Amen. Salt has gotten a bad name in the last several years. Doctors prescribe low-salt diets. Foods are advertised as having limited amounts of sodium. How many of you have loved ones who have asked you in the past several years, are you watching your salt intake? Too much salt does have adverse effects on your body's health. It affects your kidneys, it affects your blood pressure, it puts strain, a strain on your arteries and the heart overall. Perhaps future Bible translations might read, you are the Mrs. Dash of the earth. <laughs> From what I've read, however, you cannot go without salt. It helps manage the acid levels in your stomach, keeps your thyroid glands functioning, lowers adrenaline spikes, and improves sleep quality. But overall, in our culture today, salt is viewed in a negative way. Anybody on a high salt diet? <laughs> but that is not how salt was perceived in Jesus' time. In fact, salt was a critical part of everyone's daily life in the ancient world. With no refrigeration, salt was used to preserve food, especially meat and fish. Newborn babies were rubbed with salt for medicinal and symbolic purposes to preserve the baby's life. Salt was sprinkled on certain grain offerings so that they would not mold or rot. Salt was used not only to preserve but to heal, and not in a very pleasant way. If a soldier was cut in battle by a spear or a sword, salt would be rubbed into the wound. The application was painful but was needed to help heal the injury and save the soldier's life. Of course, salt was used even way back then to season food. Salt enriched the taste and made the table experience more pleasant. The Apostle Paul uses this concept in his letter to the church in Colossae. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned as it were, with salt. Today's gospel message is from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first teaching in Matthew's gospel, what has been called Jesus' inaugural address. Here Jesus gives us instructions in following his way, his program of life using sight, salt, and light in a city on the hill as metaphors. He says, you are the salt of the earth. The grammatical emphasis is on you. And as I read about this this week, I recalled the military recruitment posters. Uncle Sam wants you. And there was Uncle Sam with this scowl with his finger pointing at the person looking at the poster. There's nothing subtle about Uncle Sam. He wants you and you and you. Well, Jesus wants you and you and you. You are the salt of the earth. We are to go out and be salt in the earth. Now that means we are to demonstrate the uses of salt in our lives. The salt of the earth, I recall my father saying often, oh, he's the salt of the earth. When referring to a very good, giving, generous, compassionate person, someone he respected who goes beyond the call of duty without making unnecessary fuss, Yes, that's part of it, but more precisely, what do we say salt does? It preserves. It preserves life. It keeps things from spoiling. There are people in your life for whom you are a moral compass. That is, they look up to you for direction and guidance. You play a role in shaping and thus preserving their lives. Salt heals, it stings. There are some people in your life who need someone just to be honest with them, to tell it like it is. 
The goal is not to humiliate or embarrass, but to heal, to make things right again, and sometimes that involves pain. I have close friends who will give it to me straight because they love and care for me. We all need someone like that in our lives, and we all need to be that person for someone. Salt enlivens. It makes food tasty, zesty, flavorful. We are to bring that to our faith. By the way, have you ever tasted Fannie Mae's sea salt caramels? Unbelievable. <laughs> it's like, how can they improve Fannie Mae caramel? They put some sea salt on it. Well, I remember Pastor Leonard Blight, the pastor of the church I attended in Baltimore as a teenager. He talked in a humble way about how God was working in his life and shared what was happening in the lives of others. It was exciting to listen to him because he was one of the first Christians I ever met whose walk with Jesus seemed important and vital and meaningful and real. He walked the walk. He loved people and wanted to share the faith that meant so much to him. You may not know it, but you affect people in this way. You do not have to go around carrying a Bible and preaching to people. They see it in your life, how you treat others and give of yourself, how you deal with challenges and crises. There's a second mission we have. You are to be the light of the world. Well, didn't Jesus say he was the light of the world? Yeah, so if Jesus is the light of the world, how can we be the light of the world? And of course, it's by imitating him. In Luke's gospel, Jesus announces his mission as he is preaching in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. He gets up and reads from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn. I think all of that has a lot to do with being the light of the world. As believers, we are called out of darkness and into light, and we are to help others move from darkness to light which provides clarity and direction and context and the truth. Light reveals. Years ago, I visited friends who live in a small town in Tennessee. I actually live on a hill outside of town. There are no street lights there, much like Lake Bluff. <laughs> I noticed that. Uh, no street lights, okay. At night, just complete darkness, darkness like I've never experienced before or since. I got up in the middle of the night to do the thing that many of us do in the middle of the night. And as my eyes opened, there was no change in what I perceived. Complete darkness. I could not see anything at all. I remember holding my right hand up to my face and I could not distinguish it. I did not turn on the light because I thought, oh, my eyes will adjust to it. They didn't. And as I made my way to the room in the house where many of us go in the middle of the night, I had to picture the bedroom in my mind and reach out with my hands so that I would not run into things. Oh, there's the bed, there's the other furniture, my suitcase on the floor, the wall, the door, the hallway that led to the room in the house where many of us go in the middle of the night. And finally, I got into that room and turned on the light. Ah, I could see things clearly again. Know where everything was. Grasp the context of the space. I was thrilled. But then after I completed my task in the room where many of us go in the middle of the night, I panicked. Now I have to picture and feel my way back to the bed. 
I will never forget that experience because I can't recall ever feeling that lost before. We are called to be light to those in darkness, those with no clarity, no direction, no context, those who do not know the truth about God. There's more. You are a city built on a hill, and it cannot be hid. Picture this, in ancient times, if you were traveling at night, especially if there was no moonlight, you could see a city on a hill all lit up from miles away, a light in the darkness. In the daylight, cities on a hill provided navigation for where you were going. The Methodist church I grew up in was located at the top of a hill, and at the very peak of the very tall steeple stood an illuminated cross. Everybody in the area knew about it. You couldn't miss it. You could see it from all around, and it was so moving. When I visit Baltimore still, I like to drive past it, and you can approach from any direction, Belair Road, Northern Parkway, or Walther Avenue, it doesn't matter which street, you can see that cross from anywhere. And even today, it is a beacon, a city on a hill, it is so welcoming, comforting, reassuring. It points to something beyond us and very much in our presence. A city upon a hill is a prominent theme in the history of America. Just a week or so before John F. Kennedy took the presidential oath of office, he spoke before the Massachusetts legislature citing the Puritan John Winthrop who himself was citing the Sermon on the Mount. Today the eyes of all people are truly upon us. I'll stop the Kennedy impersonation. <laughs> and our governments in every branch, every level, national, state, and local, must be as a city upon a hill, constructed and inhabited by men and women, aware of their great trust, and their great responsibilities. As one commentator has pointed out, all three of these metaphors, salt, light, a city upon a hill, do not exist for themselves. They exist for the sake of others. They exist for something else, for the sake of something else. We exist. We are designed to give to others in service. God uses us to help make others disciples of Jesus. We are his vehicle for doing that. As followers of Jesus, there is a responsibility each of us has to the people in our lives, to children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, other family members, friends, students, colleagues, neighbors. There is a responsibility we have to be a light in the midst of their darkness. There's at least one person in your life who is looking for the hope they see in you. The Apostle Paul writes, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, shine like stars in the world. There is a second part of this message that is just as important as the first. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything. You are the light of the world, but no one after lighting a lamp puts it under a bushel basket. No, they put it on the lampstand and it gives light to the entire house. As one writer states, a disciple of the kingdom of heaven who does not live like a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is worth about as much as tasteless salt or invisible light. How about that for a guilt trip on a Sunday morning? But I hope the point is clear. We have a responsibility to those around us. 
At the end of the passage, Jesus says he did not come to abolish the law of Moses, but to fulfill it. Unless your, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the Jewish leaders, though, had become hardened, focused on the letter of the law instead of the spirit of the law, hiding behind the law instead of living it. They had the right doctrine, but their beliefs were not grounded in the heart. So, no salt, no light, no city upon a hill. As we come to the table of the Lord together, let us recommit ourselves to be salt and light and a city on a hill in the worlds we inhabit. Let your light shine before others. You and you and you shine like stars. Amen. As you will see, the liturgy for communion is in the bulletin. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us pause for a moment to prepare to approach Jesus' table. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. 
Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table of the United Methodist Church is open to all who confess Jesus as Lord, repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. We are all sinners in need of God's grace. I would ask the servers to please come forward at this time. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able for our closing hymn, This Little Light of Mine, page 585 in the Red Hymnals. are the salt of the earth, being Christ alive to those you encounter. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You are a city on a hill. Help those who are lost to navigate to finding God. And may Christ, the true light, shine upon us that we may walk in righteousness as we gather, grow, and serve together. Amen.